Now, please welcome Chief Executive Officer, Apple Leisure Group, Alex Zoizea, in discussion with Skift senior writer, Andrew Shavakman. Alex, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks, Andrew. So, Thank quick reminder before we get started, we're gonna do a Q&A at the end. Go to slido.com, hashtag Skift Forum, or submit questions on the app. Let us know what you're interested in, and we'll try to answer them. So how many of you out there have heard of Apple Leisure Group? Raise your hand. OK, all right. So for those who don't know, Apple Leisure Group is one of the most significant players in North American leisure travel. You operate hotel brands in the Caribbean and Mexico. You own an OTA. And Cheap Caribbean, you own Travel Impressions, um, a major travel and tour wholesaler. So you've got a lot of stuff going on. But to start, I want to ask about what's going on in the Caribbean right now with, with respect to the hurricanes and hurricane recovery. Can you tell us, um, you know, from your contacts with people on the ground, sort of what the status of everything is and, and what's going on there? Yeah, well, certainly we've been having a tough time with Mother Nature in the last. 90 days. You know, we had uh, all these hurricanes one after the other. Had uh, most recently Jose and, and Irma and uh, Maria and Donald. Um, <laughs> it's just been it's just been a tough tough time lately. Uh, but uh, but I have to say, uh, with all this time, and of course we're coming back um, in every single destination. Some of the destinations were more hurt than others. But we have to be uh, very mindful that a lot of destinations were not hurt. They were not hurt by the hurricane. They've been hurt now for, by the lack of connectivity. San Juan was an important hub for the region. Of course, Florida, Miami, and Fort Lauderdale, and they also had their issues, big issues with, uh, with Irma. So of course, um, the region is suffering as a, as a region. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to inform, inform better first which are the destinations that were not heard, to so encourage the people to come back. Uh, the region is not only ready, but it's also in the need to support, to be supported, and uh, of course, support all these islands that were badly hurt. So uh, there, again, there's some islands like St. Thomas, like St. Martin, uh, that were hurt a lot more than some others. We were very lucky in Dominican Republic, for example, with us, a lot of density. Uh, other places like Cuba, always not important destination or very relevant destination for Americans. It's a very important destination overall, and that was that was badly hurt. So, so we have to inform the people where the things are and where aren't, and of course help. We're trying to help right now different organizations. One of them is called uh, uh, Unidos for Disaster, and that that is to help Puerto Rico as well as as Mexico after the earthquake, Mexico City. But uh, anyway, I think that informing the people and give the right and objective and latest information and help with the connectivity as well. Uh, that's what we must do now. So you mentioned Hurricane Donald before. Alex was actually one of the first travel executives in a major role to speak out um, against what's been going on with Donald Trump. Uh, Alex, can you explain that a little bit? And Sort of tell us from your perspective as a travel executive what you've seen over the last two years and, and how you feel about what's happened. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, it's, it's, it's not great. Of course, the rhetoric from the president and before he was a president does not help traveling, especially international traveling. I think one of the biggest problems we have right now all over the world is, is hatred and uh, extremism. And hatred comes from fear, and fear comes from ignorance and intolerance. And that's what we're feeding. So that's a shame. I think that uh, we should be now in a moment of tolerance. The world, the world would be a much better world if people get to know other people in other parts of the world with other backgrounds, other ethnicities. And I think that anything that we do that prevents people from traveling, and move around and get to know people. It's actually promoting ignorance and going against combating ignorance, which eventually translates into fear and then into hatred and all the horrible things that we've been seeing. So 
travel bans, travel warnings, increased visas, the whole rhetoric of uh, isolation, that certainly hurts a travel in general. Um, so that's, that's a discourse that, that really concerns me, concerns me a lot, particularly international traveling. I think uh, Americans uh, deserve better. Um, we have what we have right now, but we deserve better in terms of be better informed and really promote, promote tolerance and, and traveling. It's a, it's a great, great weapon and a great tool to, uh, to promote peace and to promote knowledge and to promote, uh, um, again, acceptance and be a much better world if we were all supporting that cause. So I'm very concerned about what's the discourse right now. I hope it's gonna change, or it's at least gonna be moderated, but in the short term, I'm, I'm concerned about what's happening with that discourse. You cut ties with the Trump Organization in 2015, if I believe. Why do you think more travel companies haven't done something similar? Well, a lot of companies are public and a public company has to be very careful with some of the things they do, some of the things they say. We're not, we're private. Um, and, um, and I actually took it personal. So it's not just what I just described, but I took it personal and since way before he became president. So that's why we took a stand. I think I took a stand not, not on my behalf, it's not my company, I'm the CEO, but it's not my company. And it's actually an American company. We have big equity, uh, private equity funds, American equity funds, uh, now they're global, but they're based in America, behind us. So, so it's not my personal view, but I, I think I owe that to, to all of our team, uh, all of our staff, and, uh, and we have to stand for something. We cannot just let it, let it go and, and not speak. And I'm not saying companies that are not talking, at, at that, but they're a lot more careful than we are, at least more careful than I am. Sometimes people in my own company tells me, why don't you be a little bit more quiet about this issue? But, uh, but I, I have to say it. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of who I, who I am, and, and I have to say what I think. Yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you're best known for offering all-inclusive vacations, and we've had hotel CEOs up here, we've had online booking CEOs. Uh, nobody talks about all-inclusives. Why not? Well, I'm so happy they don't. They can stay away from the all-inclusive space. And <laughs> it's a terrible business, so any, any hotelier or that is thinking about going there, don't go that way. It doesn't work. No, in reality, it's a, it's a wonderful product. I mean, I mean, it's a wonderful value proposition. I think that the world is going all-inclusive in many aspects. When you buy a car now, it has a lot of the gadgets included. When you buy a computer, I remember we used to have to buy everything separate. I think even packaging, even when you go to the movies, now you buy the combo that includes the, you know, the popcorn with a with soft drink, et cetera. So I think that uh, the world is going towards convenience, but most importantly, for value for money. I think the perception on the all-inclusive, that in our company we don't call it all-inclusive, we call it all-limited luxury, simply because we are, I believe, we are one step up from what usually all-inclusives are. Uh, but there is no, there is no restrictions and there is no uh, limit in terms of really the quality of the product and the choices that you have. So the perception of getting all that on the one price is a lot more convenient. So how, how do you market against uh, some other forms of travel, other hotel brands that may be a little bit more well-known? Yeah. Is it just a value proposition or what, what is it? It's definitely a value proposition. I mean, I think that the consumer will understand that with a one price up front, number one, it's, a, it's, a, it's not cheap, but it's a certain price. They, there's no surprises at the end of the trip. Um, also the travel agents, the travel agents are a significant player in the space of distribution for the all-inclusive hotels. They also, they understand the value proposition for the customers, but they also make a lot more money. You know, travel agent makes a commission in the whole package, including taxes and tips. That doesn't happen out of the all-inclusive space. So I think it's good for the distribution, but it's also very good for the consumer. And they're coming back very, very happy from so these experiences. Talking about luxury all-inclusives, who's your market? Who is going on these? Because when I think of luxury, I think of people that will spend on individual aspects of a trip to the, as much as they want. So, yeah. so who are you going after here? Yeah, well, we're going for the luxury market. I would say we're going to the, on the, the, lo the, the, the top of the mass market. We're not okay. trying to go after the Amman Resort, Abercrombie and Kent um, type of customer. We do have some. We have a luxury brand called Zoetry that it's tailored for that, for that customer. But that's just a very small part of our business. So we are, we are the high end, but it's still uh, mass market. Yeah, so these customers, where are they from? They're from North America, and 
Is it regional? What, what does this represent? Well, we have what are they choosing you instead of what, what would they do otherwise? Go to a non-all-inclusive, would they go on a cruise? Yeah. Well, of course, cruise ships are a big competitor. And yeah. cruise ships, the luxury cruise ships, by the way, now they're including drinks. So they're really moving towards that direction also because they recognize what the consumer is seeing as a, as a value proposition. But yes, we have certainly our biggest market is the US. Uh, our distribution companies are based in the US. So more than 50% of our customers worldwide on the hotel side come from the US. Uh, but we also have very important customers in Europe, uh, Asia, Latin America. We have, for example, a lot of Mexicans visiting our hotels in Mexico. We have a lot of Panamanians losing our, visiting our hotels in Panama as well as Costa Rica. We have Colombia, Chile, Brazil. So I want to say Venezuela, but unfortunately right now it's on standby. Uh, very unfortunate, but, uh, but, but we do have people from all over the world, but I would say more than 50% of our, of our businesses is, is, uh, is the U.S., and if you add Canada as part of North America, it goes close to 65%. Yeah, so I'm curious about your branding because you have a bunch of different um, luxury hotel brands that you essentially operate and, and market. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing in the greater sort of hotel business, soft brands emerging. All these different brands targeted at different kinds of people. What's your approach to branding? Do you, do you really care about differentiating, differentiating between your brands? How do you look at that? Yeah, we have to. I think branding is very important, but I have to say, it sounds like a company that has 52 hotels that like we do now, open plus 20 on the construction for right now we have 20,000 rooms open will be 26,000 rooms we're still a small player for the amount of brands that we have we right. have six brands you say why do you want so many and of course one of the reasons is because that allows us to have more multiple properties in one destination where we already have strong distribution uh, but but we wouldn't do that unless we have differentiation among our brands so i think that differentiate ourselves not just within our brands, but most importantly, within the competitor's brand. In our space, in the all-inclusive space, a lot of the competitors that we have, they have one brand for the whole company, and often is the last name of the chairman or the last name of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the owner. That's certainly not in our case. So we really want to, and then they add Palace or Grand or Deluxe or things like that to make a distinction between luxury and non-luxury. We don't do that. We start from scratch with a completely different uh, uh, concept and value proposition to each of our brands. So what trends in traveler behavior and patterns do you pay attention to when you're designing these brands? Like you have some that are yeah. sort of spa inspired, you have others that yes. are more bare bones. Yeah, we have environmental friendly, wellness, more hip, more party like. Uh, yeah, certainly we have to look at the trends, but not just the trends that are happening in the travel sector. I think we learn a lot from the fashion. I think we learn a lot from the autom autom uh, automobile industry, technology, of course. So we need to think out of the box. I think that in the hotel side, restaurants, for example, are always one step ahead. I mean, restaurants being for a long period of time a lot more niche really communicating what they are. They don't want to be everything for everybody. So I think they, they come, there are a lot more innovators so I think we're learning from different industries, not just from the hotel industry, and try to, try to put something in front of them that is different, but it's also relevant. A lot of people do things different just from being different, but is it irrelevant for a consumer? It doesn't make any difference. But we, we see what's relevant and what are the things that we have to focus on, and then try to tailor-made the product for them, for that type of customer. So what percentage of travelers are booking with travel agents and what are going direct? How are you sort of marketing and reaching, marketing to and reaching these customers and how are you bringing them in? That's a very important question because unlike other global brands, in our space, in our region, I have to honestly say that distribution is way more powerful than brand. And that's why you see players non-branded, hotels that if I tell your name, I'm not going to do it, but if I start mentioning names, very few people will recognize some hotels, and they're very successful. And I could mention some very global brands, big, big brands, and very, very known brands that are having trouble in the Caribbean and Mexico on the leisure space, and they've been having trouble for a long time, some of them. Some of them are very successful. And the reason is because I think these global brands underestimate the power of distribution. So on the power of distribution, the number one distributor to this type of product is still is a travel agent with charter or with a commercial flight, but it's still on the packaging world, which is the way the consumer is buying this type of holiday. The distribution is crucial, even more important than brand. But I would say more than maybe 55% still is B2B travel agents. And then the other 45%, you have the consumers that are 
loyal to the brands. You have the vacation clubs, which are becoming a lot more important as loyalty programs, as a distribution channel for the hotel companies. They have their own vacation club to have these loyal customers coming back. And then you, of course, have now the technology and all of the OTAs. The OTAs are very important for us as well. One of our biggest customers uh, um, overall is Expedia, for example. So do you think that the OTAs have really cracked the whole packaging thing and the bundling? Because the product is available, but it's not really presented very well. Yeah. What are your thoughts on sort of the potential there? Well, there's, there's, there's a lot of potential. I think they're doing a much better job now than they did in the past. They didn't have, recently, they didn't have uh, dynamic, dynamic packaging. It was a very convenient way to buy the hotel only. But I think that when traveling, particularly traveling internationally, which is a completely different behavior, the travel agent becomes a lot more relevant when they add value, and they add value when they, well, a lot more value when the people are traveling for the first time and when people are traveling internationally. So um, that's when the package makes a lot more sense and people are trying to buy the whole, the whole thing. But I think the OTAs are moving in that direction. Uh, they, they are a lot more relevant and powerful now, not just for us, but for any other hotel company in the, in the, in the region. But I think there's still the niche that we have on our OTA, which, for example, Chip Caribbean is the expert in beach. We don't try to sell anything else that packages to beach resorts. Uh, it used to be just Caribbean. Uh, but now we sell also Hawaii and, of course, Mexico and Central America. And that is that, that, that even our OTAs are going a lot more niche and the consumer is going to that um, uh, channel in order to, to buy specific holidays when they're traveling internationally. But I think the OTAs are moving in the right direction and, and they're doing a good job. What about travel agents? What do you see for them? Because they had sort of fallen down, now they've sort of built themselves back up. Yeah. Um, clearly they're crucial to your business, but what are they doing now that maybe they weren't doing a couple of years ago? Well, they're doing a lot, and I think a lot of people think that the travel agent is an endangered species and they're disappearing. I tell you, there's a lot less travel agent agencies, but the number of travel agents remains up there. And I love to see these young people, now people looking for self-employed or working from home, that are entering to the space of travel agents. So there's also new, fresh generation coming into the space of travel agents. I think the travel agents now, of course, they need to add a lot more value than in the past. So they're a lot more knowledgeable than they were in the past. But they're also using technology a lot more. One of the things that we, that we do for travel agents is giving the tools, giving them the right platform to make their job easier, and not just easier for them, but also a lot more aligned with what the customer is looking for. So uh, they're moving in the right direction in terms of, of, of using the technology in the right way to better inform their customers and to have the, the loyalty of their customers uh, coming back. So I think travel agents are not going anywhere. I think they're changing the business model to add different type of value in order to be able to not just to survive but to grow. And, uh, and I think a lot of them are doing the right way. So earlier this year, um, ALG was acquired by a private equity group, or you took an investment from a private equity group. What was that about, and, and what is that helping you do going forward? Yeah, up to the end of 2012, it was, this was 100% a family business. And then in 2012, uh, we did a bidding process, and Bain Capital ended up buying the majority stake on our group. And then Bain Capital hold the company for, or their shares in the company for about three and a half years. Then we engaged in a new process. Uh, it was a wonderful cycle for Bain Capital. And then uh, the result after this uh, latest uh, bidding process was that KKR, in conjunction with KSL, which is a smaller private equity fund but, but specializing in the hospitality, they, they both joined forces to buy the majority stake in our company from Bain Capital. We, the executives as a, and the family, we still remain shareholders in the company. But uh, that happened in March of this year. And the idea is for them to add knowledge, but also add uh, a know-how, but particularly on the M&A side, they being a, a big help. And the idea is to grow the company significantly through M&A, as well as organic. And, uh, and of course, they're providing a lot of capital. So when we spoke this summer, Alex, you talked a little bit about looking to expand the company potentially into Asia. Um, given everything that's happened in the Caribbean, maybe that's changed now, but, but what are you thinking about for the future? Where do well, you see the growth market? I still think we, we have a lot to grow in our region within, let's say, within five hours of flying from our main market, which is the US. So Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America. Uh, now we are uh, in Colombia, which is a little bit 
further south from, from our typical region. I think we still have a lot to grow there. The pipeline is very strong in that region. But yes, there's, a, there's, there's opportunity to rep reproduce a business model that we have in places like Asia, using some important distribution companies that are very relevant and very significant in leisure destinations like, like Phuket in Thailand or like Bali or Vietnam, that we could replicate that model and start opening or managing hotels for third parties over there, customized to that customer with, with our business model. And then Europe. Europe is also very important. We see uh, good opportunities in Spain. We have a lot of uh, uh, of common customers that are buying a product when they come to this part of the world and they have the same customer wanting to go to Thailand, for example, but we don't have a product there. And on, on that common uh, distribution that we already have could be well utilized to start uh, growing in Europe as well. Awesome. So time for the Q&A. Um, let's hope that works. Oh, there we go. All right. Question one. What's the most exciting market for you right now, Alex? The most exciting market from the uh, from from the from the gateway standpoint. Um, what it, makes you feel good? <laughs> I I have to tell you um, what makes me feel good. I still see a lot of hope. I mean, knowing that uh, I, I, I had do double double feelings about what I saw happening back in November, but when you see the hope that the, number one, the majority of Americans vote against what we have. And then within that, you have the large population of young people, the majority of the young people going that way. So I, I think what makes me happy and what makes me feel good is when I have these conversations with people that have an open minded, regardless of the age, but particularly when I talk to young people, I see a lot more hope and a lot more optimism and uh, moving in the, right, in the right direction and huge appetite for traveling. So the appetite for, for traveling from the young people uh, and, and, and that, that what it means in terms of, of, of the future of our business is tremendous. So that makes me feel very good. All right, time for one more quick question. Would you ever try to go direct to consumer in your distribution strategy in a serious way? Yeah, we are now the regular to consumer. Our OTA goes the regular to consumer. AIM Resorts, a hotel company, goes directly to consumer with the different brand secrets, dreams, uh, now Zoetry, et cetera, Breathless. But, uh, but, but, and, and we do it in a serious way, but of course, the money is never enough to go to the consumer. So yes, for the first time now, we're putting mass market TV campaigns and the technology, and we spend a lot more in social, in social media to go directly to consumer. But at the same time, we're putting a lot of money to keep our travel agents loyal. All right, Alex, we're out of time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.